try as hard as you possibly can not to have a billion dollars. How do you think people will talk about you in 10,000 years? Like who was Kevin oh, Kelly? Yes. I have a very certain answer of that. I will be forgotten 100%. People don't recognize how fast we fade from people's memories. You, I, not just me, but most people are not going to be remembered beyond three generations, four generations. It's, you're gone. So get used to that. The world doesn't have to be perfectly good. It can be just a little bit better. That world, Protopia, has plenty of problems. In fact, I would suggest that we're going to make problems of a size and degree that we've never seen before. But the reason why I'm, I remain optimistic in this protopia is because I think our capacity to solve problems increases even faster. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of Through Conversations podcast, a platform where we explore the truth through conversations with the most brilliant minds. And here in front of me today is a brilliant mind indeed, Kevin Kelly. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to, to have you here because if I would have known, you know, if you, you have, would have written your book, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I'd Wish I'd Known Earlier, I think 10 years ago, where and you, write, you write one of your advices was that if you saw a mouse, it probably, if you think you saw a mouse, you probably saw a mouse. And there's probably 10 more. And so I was in my house and all of a sudden I see a little mouse walking and I tell my mom, hey, there's a mouse in the house. And she's like, we probably need to go to therapy, Alex. Are you okay? How's school? And mom, I'm telling you, there's a mouse. And all of a sudden my brother opens up his closet and there's three mouses in the house. So you're, you're spot on, Kevin, with your advice. <laughs> I'm very honored to have you here, not only because of... of your advice to me, but also because mm -hmm. you're part of the Long Now Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I would like to start off with, you know, not, not your trajectory per se, but how do you think people will talk about you in 10,000 years? Like who was Kevin oh, Kelly yes. in the Long yes, Now? I, I have a very, very certain answer of that. I will be forgotten 100% not just in 10,000 years, um, probably within 100 years. People um, uh, don't recognize how fast we fade from people's memories. I'm sure, well, at least I don't have any knowledge of my great, great grandparents. That's just, was that three generations? Four generations, it's, you're gone. And um, you, I, not just me, but most people are not going to be remembered beyond 500 years for sure. So you will just be eradicated completely. Oh, you know, it's very, very few, tiny, tiny percent of people who might be remembered in any way. So get used to that. Do you find that insight liberating or anxiety-inducing? You know, it would be nice if it wasn't like that, but um, I think uh, I think what you have to do is you have to realize that our gift for being alive is very short and you have to maximize that time right now we can't rely on a kind of persevering after we're gone it's like no you 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 have a very very definite period and it's it's within that period that you have to have whatever impact you're going to have and that's sort of what we have right now is um in our bodies in our lives in this time is a way to have impact I think that, for example, it's, it's, it's interesting because, of course, your book, Excellent Advice for, for Living, is, I think, tailored for my generation, 20-somethings, 25-year-olds, maybe mid, uh, beginning late 20s or early 20s. Mm -hmm. And when I heard you in your answer, when you said, we're not going to be here for 500 years, in 500 mm -hmm. years, right, we're not going to be remembered, for me, it actually made my palms a bit sweaty. 
Like mm -hmm. a lot of the things that I weigh in in my life at these mm -hmm. early stages of my career, you could say, is legacy mm -hmm. and success. And probably a lot of mm -hmm. our listeners will also relate. And so when you were 25 years old, Kevin, did you have also kind of these, uh, you know, uncertainties about who you were going to become or who you were mm -hmm. or these themes of, of legacy and how have those involved around your, your life? Yeah, no, I, I, I did not. I was, when I was 25, I was had very little money and I was traveling in Asia. Um, and which, um, I think in some ways helped, um, lengthen my perspective on the world. And, um, My prospects were very um, narrow in a certain sense. I I uh, was I didn't have a career. I didn't have a college degree. I, my expectations were fairly low. I was sort of aiming to never have any money, but having lots of time to do interesting things. Because I realized by then that. You didn't really need money to do interesting things. It was a matter of um, willpower and having a choice. Um, and that was sort of what I was resigning myself to as sort of um, a quiet life, maybe you could say, of following my own path with very little prospects of great achievement. Mm. Um, and so I think it was very... It was close. And then traveling in these big countries like India with billions of people, you kind of, um, I got the impression that the world operates, the, 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 the world at large operates at kind of um, a, very, a very slow, long speed. Mm -hmm. um, there's deep roots in history and it'll probably continue. And then our lives are rather very very small compared to you know the cosmos and so i i thought it was i thought there was wisdom in people who preached starting with your immediate surroundings as a place to have effect on the world The, the the bit of advice is like, you know, to clean your city, you begin by sweeping your own doorstep. And that that idea of beginning where you are and going outward um, as a means to, to make change was, was something that I understood or I came to understand in, in, in my 20s. Wow. Yeah, and it's... When when you were 25 years old, Kevin, mm -hmm. it's it's really amazing because I, I think that the, the here the the contrast is that for example, our you know the way we are growing with the rapid technology and also mm -hmm. the instant uh, you could you could put it this way the instant way of comparing ourselves with our peers you know mm -hmm. through LinkedIn through Instagram you know who's doing mm -hmm. better who's ranking better all of those things and all of a mm -hmm. sudden one begins to to you know lose sight of following what you just said following your own path not even knowing mm -hmm. how to follow one's own path right. because all of this external noise right. everyone's doing this so i should probably focus on that and so mm -hmm. how would you uh how would you tackle this challenge that we're facing now you know younger generations that you know maybe we're losing mm -hmm. sight of of what truly matters in life which is you know maximizing your time following your own path yeah. And right. trying to to harvest those themes, yeah. those values in your life. Yeah, I I, 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 th I certainly think that you know, being connected to everybody else in the world all the time, twenty four hours a day, makes it more difficult to kind of think differently, which is what you want to be doing. I would say a couple of things. One is 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 if you're young, particularly, um, you know, try to work in an area where they don't have words for what it is that you're doing, where there's no language. Mm -hmm. And and that, I think, is one way that you can um, have more of a chance to be arriving at something that you are uniquely suited to do by, by, by going beyond where there's names and language and words. 
for what it is that's happening, what it is that you're doing. So, um, and I think, um, so, you know, so, 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 so being a little confused and perplexed about things is actually, to me, a good sign um, if you're on a path, if you kind of, if you're pursuing something that's well known, you know, you want to be a movie star, you want to be a, bas a basketball star, you want to be the world's best, uh, richest person. Those are all things that are highly competitive. They're already occupied by somebody else, and you're very unlikely to reach it. But if you are on a path to try and discover who you are and what you can do uniquely and different, there's no competition. And so um, if you're doing it right, and it's a lifelong journey, it doesn't happen all at once. You're kind of moving in that direction slowly. And I think um, a good sign that you're moving in the direction is that there's no words for what it is. There, there is um, the other thing that's also important is if you find yourself doing things that you find easy that other people find hard, that's a good sign. And then the third sign is um, if you're doing kinds of things that people find um, boring or torturous and yet you love to do, that's another good sign that you're going in the right direction. So, um, you know, I know artists who love spending hours and hours doing these little lines. And it's like that would... I can't do that. Or writers who who want to write a hundred thousand word, or, excuse me, a thousand words every day, because they love to do that. That's also something that I find difficult. And so, um, it's it's those kinds of things where you you're paying attention to your own um, your own inclinations, your own curiosity, and you're kind of pursuing them despite. Well, other people may say about it, despite whether it's currently seeming economical. Um, and so there requires a little bit of um, trusting, trusting yourself, a little bit of bravery um, to go in that direction. And, and, and I'll say the last thing about that is um, lots of, decisions in our lives present themselves as one way saying like you can't like there's you go through the door you can't come back that's very rarely true it's very rare that you can't turn around and if something's not working go backwards it's there are occasionally some but they're, they're very very rare um but nonetheless i i also one of the ways you do this is that you you prototype, you test, mm -hmm. you do small steps, you try something as a hobby, as a side hustle first, just to see. You shadow somebody. You want to be a welder? Shadow them for one day just to see. You want to be a lawyer? Volunteer to be there for a week to see if you really want to do what they're doing. And so... There are things like that that you can um, you can move forward in kind of small steps and testing things. Well, there's a ton there to, to to unpack, and I think that you know to summarize it a bit is you know I I know that one of your best beats or rather your favorite beats from the excellent advice for of, for leaving your book is don't be the best, be the one, and only, I think it connects. Only, yeah. Be the only, be the only. I apologize. Right, I right, just, right, right. We should stop English, right here, yeah. Kevin. We should stop yeah. here. <laughs> um, it connects with two things that, that you also write on is that you shouldn't measure your life with somebody else's ruler that mm -hmm. you also discuss right now is how to hone in and how to build your own measure mm -hmm. in life. But also it connects with another idea that is kind of, it's kind of tangential, but I think I I, I want to connect with it, is that you should manage yourself. You say that you should manage yourself with your mind and you should manage other people with your heart. Mm -hmm. And so here when I was reading that and I was like, after reading it, I went for a walk and then I started thinking, you know, 
often, and I, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you're very tuned in with your intuition. I feel that mm -hmm. the, the advice for younger people is also to hone into that intuition, into that, yeah. what the heart says. And so mm -hmm. how can we find that perfect balance between, you know, managing ourselves, not only rationally, but also tuning into that heart? Our heart. I don't think there is a perfect balance. I think there is. Um, I think you may be swinging from one to another, but that's what we do when we walk. We're kind of, we're leaning forward or almost falling. Then we recover and then we take the next. And so there is this sort of persistent disequilibrium. I don't think you're ever in equilibrium. In fact, in life, in those, in ecology, equilibrium is death. You're in persistent disequilibrium. So I think... So, yeah, so, so balance is not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for kind of persistence, unbalance. That's just the right kind of unbalancing. And so um, you, you, you do need to, you know, pay attention to um, emotional things as well, logical things. And so, you know, particularly of a certain kind of a person, and maybe the people I am in, there's an emphasis on intellect IQ, um, logic, but so much of things is accomplished not by intellect. You need many other qualities. You have to, you have to add so many more things besides intelligence to get things done. And oftentimes, the most, the person with the most achievements is not necessarily the smartest person. And so, um, yeah. So you want to attend to these other things um, as well, and. Um, you can get better at it, at, at, just like you can get better at thinking. Do you feel that this, for example, switching into a bit of of you know your perspective on technology for just this mm -hmm. this segment? Do you feel that AI will allow us to, you know, with having more freedom in terms of repetitive jobs, rather? Yeah. Do you think we'll have free time, more free time to hone in into? who we are? Yes, I do. I mean, people, the, the reason why we right now, I mean, we would not be doing this 150 years ago. Neither one of us would have had enough time to to do these kinds of things. We would be weeding, you know, working on a farm, whatever. We would, it would be really tough work. So we have been liberated in part through technology, making it easier to grow food, needing less people, And I think the same thing will happen with the AI, that there will be more leisure in general. Not 100%, but there'll be more, more leisure from the AI automating things that we prefer not to do ourselves. Um, but also, also, I think an additional um, factor pertaining to our earlier conversation is that AI's... Um, while they'll be very intelligent, very smart, smarter than us in many dimensions, um, they're never going to be, they, they don't think like us. They're, 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 their kind of intelligence is not human-like. It's slightly different. It's like Spock on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think there'll be multiple species hundreds, maybe thousands of different species of AIs, different qualities, different strengths, different personalities. And I think the advantage is that we can use them to help us think different. I mean, going back to the, to the agenda of, of us is that we want to think a little differently. That's the mm -hmm. genesis of the new wealth in this era. We're coming up with a new idea, something different, different product. And that's hard to do when you're connected all the time and you have um, total world universal connection. So the AIs can actually help us think differently and can help individuals try out and figure out um, how to do something a little differently than, than everybody else. And so I think, I think that's the second um, virtue of, of the AIs in people's lives. Yeah, it seems that in a world driven by all of this rapid acceleration of technology, you know, AI, this little piece of advice that you say on on excellent advice for living, 
is that, quote, experiences are fun and having influence is rewarding, but only mattering, uh, only building some uh, stuff that matters makes us happen, do stuff that matters. I'm mm-hmm. botching it a bit there, but it's the question here is, in a world driven by AI, what stuff should we build that would matter? Like, what what is the thing that we should focus on on an earlier age? Because it seems that, like you say, all of the repetitive, boring jobs, at least, you know, I'm hopeful, honestly, will be replaced. So where should we lock in and focus our attention to? Yeah. Just to clarify, I think it's the tasks that people that we don't want to do that can be automated. And some people will want to do them, <clears throat> just, just, just to be clear. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's the individuals. Like I might not want to, um, you know, uh, let's say, fill out a spreadsheet, but some people would because they enjoy that kind of work. So, so um, it's, it's different tasks that are being done. And, and the question of um, what do we... Um, where does that leave us? I, th- I think um, you know, there's, there's uh, we, we, the, the short answer is is we don't know how this AI thing is going to to pan out. We 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 think we know what intelligence is, but we we have no idea. We have no theory. Of it. We have no. We, we we don't have enough that we we cannot predict where it's going because we don't have any theory about what it is that's being replaced. And um, you know, as as we imagine an economy where people are, um, you know, certain tasks are, are being certain. You you want to know well what what can we do? What can an individual do? How we how can we figure out what we're good at when um, robots and AIs are so good at so many things. Um, I think, I I think this is, I think this this uncertainty is going to be around for a while. And um, I think it's also going to take a long time to penetrate, even though, these things seem very smart right now. I think this is going to take a decade for their impact economically. And maybe multi, you know, it's like self-driving cars. are still going to be a decade away. So that means that there's lots of time to figure things out. And I think the best way to figure them out is to try and use them as much as you can. I don't think everybody is... Obligated. I don't think you have to use AI, but if you want to have some opinion about, opinions about it, then you have to. If you want to make some decisions about it, then you need to use it as much as you can. And so, um, and so, I, I think there's time to figure these out, and I think I think we're going to figure them out incrementally. So, so, so th- there's something I call thinkism, which is the the fallacy of, of believing that you can figure everything out by thinking about it. And I think this is one of those cases where we're not going to figure this out by thinking about it. We actually have to use it a lot day to day to kind of really figure out what it is. And so I'm a proponent of of people trying to use these as a means to thinking out. If you're uncertain about it and care about it, then use it as much as you can. And that use will inform what we think about it. So right now there's a lot of attention paid to imaginary harms, meaning Mm -hmm. harms that we could imagine. There's very little actual harm from AI. It's all imaginary harm. And I would rather have a kind of an evidence-based policy. So let's, let's base it on what actually happens. And so um, that's going to take a while. So I, I, I guess I want to divert a lot of the, was the word speculation about AI to say it's, we have to remember that it's primarily speculation and all we have right now are the, the Hollywood movies, which are all dystopian, which tell a very bad, horrible story about AI that's going to rise up and kill us. Um, it would be good to have alternative 
pictures of that. But remember that both both of these are speculations. And then if you actually look at the data right now, so far AI has been helping people, programmers especially, programming faster, better, writers, a, a little better, researchers, great, teachers, fantastic, doctors, a lot. So that's that's where we are so far. I think as we use it more, we'll have more of an idea of what's good. We don't have a theory yet. Maybe someone will have a theory that can help us. So um, I'm excited by what's coming because when I speculate, when I imagine it, I can see all the many good things as well as some down. But I think overall, I'm expecting a net gain that there's more positive things than negative. So I'm excited about what's coming. Yeah, it's it's exciting to hear you. And also because, you know, like you say, we're being pulled by all of these uh, stories that mm -hmm. appeal to, to our paranoia rather than our pronoia, right. like you write. They appeal to, hey, they're coming for our jobs, they're coming, uh, Terminator yeah, is coming. Yeah. And they sell, like you, like you say. And actually, Ari Wallach in her interview said uh, he credited you with the word pronoia, with protopia right, rather, right. not pronoia, protopia. Yeah, yeah. And so, for our listeners who didn't watch that interview, would you like to to share? You know, what's protopia? How is it different to yeah, dystopia yeah. and utopia? So, as I was saying, uh, an awful lot of the visions, particularly in contemporary science fiction, the last twenty. 30 years has been very dystopian, meaning that if you imagine the world in the future, it's not a world that you want to live in. There's uh, everything's gone wrong, and many of them maybe there's disasters, catastrophe, there's zombies, right? And so, um, there's almost no Hollywood images of a, of a future with high tech AI, genetic engineering that you'd want to live in, and um. In some ways, that's because we're uh, a little anti-utopian, which I, which I am also. I, I am not a fan of utopias, in part because they're not just unrealistic. I think they're also undesirable, meaning that a description, any description of utopia that I heard is very static and not only impossible, but probably undesirable in terms of what place to want to live. So I propose um, something in between utopia, the unattainable utopia, and the undesirable dystopia. And I call it protopia, which means a place, a, a world, that's a little bit better than today. Each, each year is a tiny, tiny little bit better than the year previous. Almost so tiny that it's almost invisible. Except if you turn around in retrospect, because that tiny difference can accumulate and aggregate and compound over time. And so if we can manage to create just a few percent more than we destroy every year, that 2% can, can add up and compound over time. So the world doesn't have to be perfectly good. It can be just a little bit better than yesterday. And I think that a little bit better is what I call protopia. And the pro comes from progress, proceeding, pro versus con. Pro is an early, like a prototyping. And so it's this idea that we're moving forward very slowly, but we're in the right direction. And I think if we can make a... So that world, protopia, has plenty of problems. In fact... I would suggest that we're going to make problems of the size and degree that we've never seen before. But the reason why I'm, I remain optimistic in this protopia is because I think our capacity to solve problems increases even faster. So we're getting better at solving problems. So the problems will get bigger, but we get better at solving problems. That's that's interesting and and just to, to push back a little bit on that, because I, I feel that, you know, that this would be like an, a question that people would comment on or would be concerned with is that, like you say, 
and you, you said previously with AI, you'd rather see evidence that AI is taking away jobs, that AI is causing problems and then solve it like an yeah, evidence yeah. based. And so how can we convince people who say, you know what, we should get ahead of the curve. We should start anticipating the problems we might see before they happen. The big ones, for example, so we can, you know, of course, prevent them or, you know, be on a better position to handling them rather than just in hindsight. I, I, I think it's good. I think it's good to try and get ahead. The, the, the difficulty is that we're terrible at predicting things. <laughs> and um, so I, 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 I think we should operate in terms of scenarios. Mm. And um, we, should, we should have different responses at the ready. We should prepare for different kinds of futures, including ones where there's, there's a problem. So the problem may not happen or it may happen in a different way. And if we prepared completely for this other way to solve the problem and it doesn't work, then we're caught off guard. So we want to have um, – the main thing about the future is we don't want to be surprised by it. We want to rehearse many different possibilities about where things could go in terms of preparing it. If, we're, if there's evidence that the problem exists, well, then, then we have the evidence – We have evidence of the climate change. There's not, this is not a matter of speculating. The, we have to speculate on what the solutions would be that might work. But, with, but the problem is very clear. Um, so, 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 in fact, I, I think it's so clear that for me, climate change is, is a tractable problem. It's, it's a problem we know how to solve. It's a problem we know what to do. AI, the problems in AI may not be tractable, meaning we, we don't know what we would have to do. We don't know what a solution would look like. So, so, that's, so those are, those are in, uh, intractable problems, and they're kind of much more um, challenging because we don't know. Climate change, we know exactly what we have to do. So, um, but we don't know what the solutions are that would work. And so I think... Um, I think uh, it is good to try and get a little ahead of problems, particularly if we have evidence of them. Uh, if you're getting ahead of problems that, that don't exist yet, that we have no evidence for, mm. then we have to be careful. We don't want to assign too much. There should be, you know, it's, it's like um, right now, there's a great group of people called B612. It's a nonprofit institution. And their job is to detect asteroids to prevent an asteroid from wiping off humanity. Now, that's a legitimate problem. It's very, very unlikely to happen anytime in the near future. But if it did, it would be catastrophic. So it's good that there are some people who are working on that. But we don't have to, every year, go through what's our policy about asteroid impact. That's, that's just a waste of time. We don't want it, to – it's such a low probability, even though very disastrous, that it's good that there's a group on it, but we don't have to have a policy based around it. And the same thing with AI. Yes, it's possible AI could take over and kill us all. It's, it's not impossible, but it's so unlikely – that we don't want to have policy based on that. We have a couple of people working on that problem. That's fine. But we're not going to make policy about AI use and stuff based on the idea that it might kill us. That's just not, this is so improbable. It's not worthwhile. It's not logical. So, um, so yes, we, we, we can think about get ahead of problems that are real. And we want to have somebody thinking about things that, might happen that's good but we don't want to spend a lot of time we want to base policy around that until we have some evidence yeah it's it's a great point and i think that the the, the closest we have for evidence and you, you've you've uh said the opposite is that well the biggest concern people have is it will take our jobs and and you've said kelly previously that ai will 
complement our jobs. AI will allow us to unleash yeah. our potential, whether it be yeah. creative, whether it be... Yeah, yeah. So should we prepare for... I know this is speculation and we can switch topics, but I'm just interested in your perspective that if there was a, a moment in time, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, where AI effectively has taken away people, uh, jobs from people, how should we tackle that challenge and what yeah. should we do with our time? Let's say our leisure time, like we discussed yeah. previously. Well, th so let's be clear. So far, as of April 24th, 2024, almost nobody has lost their job to AI. There's been a few translators um, and there's a few, and I say few, I mean probably, I don't know, less than 100 and maybe some people who do transcription, medical transcription, who've lost their jobs to AI. In terms of the world, that's insignificant. It's just not, we, we can say nobody has lost their job to AI so far. In five years, could somebody, it's possible. And all I would say is, let's see what it looks like in five years, why they lost their job, what was it, what was the variety, What? and, and so let's look at it. Because... Um, that's evidence-based. Right now, we can think about it, and um, we're just going to be worried about something that I would be very, very surprised if there was um, massive unemployment in five years. I would be shocked. Hopefully, that's the case because, and I, I want to subscribe to your ideas because you know the probably the mainstream uh, conversation and the ones being flooded is. And ready, get ready for, for this change that will happen. And so it probably won't happen. Like you say, it'll complement our jobs. It'll allow us to uh, explore more of who we are and bringing it back into, you know, the conversation into ourselves, Kevin, uh, you said you tweeted the past week from your 73rd year old birthday. So happy birthday, by the way, is that you should forget trying to decide what your life's destiny is. That's too grand. Instead, just figure out what should you what you should do in the next two years. And so I started thinking about that, you know, of course, for, for our conversation. Yeah. And trying to do the connection with also the long now, being a good ancestor, trying to think long term as a twenty five year old and what should I do in the next two years? And so how how should I approach this? You know, I wanna think about the next two years, but also think, you know, longer than my own life for my grandchildren and their grandchildren. Yeah, I think, so I'm co-chair of the Long Now Foundation, which is trying to foster long-term perspectives and the long-term imagination and responsibility. What, what we don't suggest is trying to make 100-year plans. You don't want to plan your, your future for the next 50 years. Plans, the only reason to make a plan is to immediately throw it away. The making of the, the process for making the plans would be useful. The plan is not going to be useful to you. Um, we, we, we're, we're trying to encourage a long-term perspective, this idea of um, understanding, again, like we began the conversation, that there are these, that, that civilization has a scale that's way beyond the human that there are things that are good for the world that you can be working on that you may not finish. Mm. Okay? Or that may even take two decades of your own life to accomplish. So you may start on something, um, and it could be something as simple as your health, physical fitness. Maybe it doesn't take two weeks. Maybe you have to work on it for 20 years before you get there. So this, the, the, this is the idea that there are many things in our society still today, despite the rapid pace, that will take a lot of time and are worth doing and should be done. And so um, so that's that kind of... And, and, and also, by the way, there are things that we now enjoy that took centuries of people previously to, to make, and we should not take those for granted either. Um, so there's there there's it's it's more of a perspective that you want to have rather than plans, mm -hmm. and um, 
the perspective can help you in several ways. One is, um, again, the longer, the higher, the, the longer your horizon, the easier it is to be an optimist, for one thing. And secondly, the longer the horizon, um, it's easier to overcome setbacks, which they will come. Setbacks will come. But if your horizon's at a decade or two decades, then you can over you can absorb quite significant setbacks or downturns. You know, if if you're willing to hold stock for twenty years, if it goes down even fifty percent, that's may not bother you. Okay, so so you that's the perspective, and so um, uh, if you if you take a longer perspective about um, what it is that you were trying to accomplish, um, you might be able to do it very quickly and you might be able to do it faster than you thought. But if you take a long perspective, it gives you the ability to overcome things and to appreciate the the, the gains in a way that um, having a very short term perspective does not allow you to. So you have more freedom in a certain sense. You have a lot more runway. You've 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 you you've widened your perspective. And I think to me part of wisdom is just having a longer viewpoint. Well it's you know I, I, I think that for my generation it's getting difficult more more difficult to hone in into that longer uh term perspective just because like we discussed previously we're very like my generation we're very drawn into the instant gratification of things you know getting immediate results also again we see how all of our peers are doing quote unquote better than us in one second like we're all the time we're seeing all of these things happening mm -hmm. so fast and so on your perspective kevin how can i myself how, how can i really harvest how can i really build that longer perspective on a personal mm -hmm. level that's a good question how do you get the longer perspective um for one of the things that helped me was 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 reading a lot of history hmm If you read the history and you go back, you understand a little bit more about the longer term, the, the, the lower frequencies that are governing the world. And you see, you see kind of the momentum that things have. And you see the things like, like religious beliefs and other things that are slower moving. And so um, for me, that has really helped thinking about the future in long term is to have a more and more of a sense of history, more and more of um, an immersion into how weird the past was, which will help us pre to prepare for the weird things coming into the future. And so I think um, that is an important thing. Immerse yourself in history. And the second thing I think that helps is... Um, Actually, I think having children helps because then you're forced to begin to be thinking of, of other generations, future generations. Um, work with children if you don't have some. And um, uh, I, I think that's, you know, understanding that, that most of the people in the world have yet been born, All right? So there's going to be more people in the future than there have been in the past. And so mm -hmm. there is this idea of... Um, our, obligation to them our um you know, being a good ancestor so so i i think working with kids and hanging around young people is another thing to do besides history and then um cultivating that long term i i think it's just a, a very deliberate skill it's like anything else it's like going to the gym or studying for exams i think you can one become more optimistic you can choose to be more optimistic and i think you can also Um, develop the skill of taking a longer term view of, of things, understanding that, um, you know, looking at things in terms of decades, multi-decades rather than quarters, 
You can still do the quarters. You need to act on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. But you want to be thinking in terms of decades and centuries. And so I think it's, um, I think you can choose to do that. Like you say, like you're writing excellent advice for living, you know, the biggest, the most important rule that we should try to, to create in our lives and follow is the golden rule that also applies for future generations. Yes. The golden rule with them. And so here's where I admire you a lot, Kevin, because history has shown us that, you know, nature, humanity, us between us, and, you know, <laughs> all of the external factors as well as internal can be really brutal. Like history has shown us that history has been brutal. And what I admire you admire from you is that you're a very optimistic person yeah. and, and you try to encourage that. And so how do you extract the optimistic side of the the optimistic insights from history and, yeah. and boiling down for the present moment, Kevin? So 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 I think this let's talk about history. I think one of the reasons why you should read history is to is to get a very evidence based education on the reality of our own progress. So 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 this is you know Stephen Pinkers and others like if you take an impartial view of history, you have to acknowledge how we are so much better off than in any previous time in history. So we have made our world better. And I would go so far as say we, we as animals, as hominids, as primates, we've invented our own humanity. It was our, we were the first animals we domesticated were ourselves. So, so we have invented our humanity and we're still inventing it. And if you look in a very unbiased scientific way, you have to agree that the best year to be alive as a human is 2024. If you, Take it statistically, globally. If, if if you could not, if you could not choose how you're going to be born, whether you're going to be born male, female, slave, or whatever, the only year you want to be born is this year, right? Because any other year in history would have been pretty tough as a random as a random human somewhere in the world, and so so. Um, Part part of of that part of being an optimist has to begin with the acknowledgement of the reality of progress in our own lives. As bad as sometimes a day may seem, if you read history, you realize that compared to what has been, it's just better now. Overall, there's tremendous problems. But the problems of the past were even worse. So, and, and that's true politically, that's true economically, that's true socially. It's, it's, it, 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 we have made progress. That's the beginning of being able to be optimistic about the future is, is, is thoroughly absorbing that reality. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of disagreement about the the plus and benefits but again if you take a very objective view of um of the world looking at everything from health longevity rights opportunities there's no question that on average the average person being born on the planet today is better off than they were even 100 years ago let alone a thousand years ago What is what is one book, Kevin, that I should dive into in hist for history? I'm not really reading history right now, so which one would you recommend? Oh my gosh. Um So what's your I mean the, the, what's your what what's your pleasure? Is this just to convince you of progress? Is this for the enjoyment of uh is this to educate you in terms of you know, the, the general current. G give me a little bit more about, I mean, there's, there's actually historical fiction. There is, um, you know, um, yeah, give me, give me a little bit more. 
I'd say yes. The one that really, one book that really convinced you that we're really making great progress. I know Steven Pinker wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature, but and also which would be like the, the other uh, Enlightenment. He wrote the uh, sec the second one, which is which more. Enlightenment. Um, so so um, Enlightenment now. I can't remember. Um, yes, I think it's Enlightenment now. Um, what would be a one the one book? <laughs> you know, Robert Wright wrote a book called Non Zero, okay. which I, I like because he has a couple explanations about the mechanism for our progress, which is, um, you know, our um, cooperation. You know, um, uh, Homo sapiens is, 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 you know, not bad. Um, Let's see. I read a book um, on the Silk Road. Um, the actual old Silk Road that was really magnificent in terms of revealing larger trends of um, that were going on and that continue to go on in the world today. And so it's not as hard hitting on like trying to convince you of progress, but it is very good about surfacing the kinds of momentum in the world that began that had been running through Europe and uh, Asia and that interface. And so, um, you know, that's that's another thing of history, not just to convince you of progress, but just the fact that those many of the currents that are now in the world have very deep roots and if you can understand those roots you can understand the currents right now so so the silk road was one of those um peter frankton i think is is a, another one oh fantastic one it's called um genghis khan and the making of the modern world it's mm -hmm. about the mongols and this is the argument that actually genghis khan was like one of the first modern people all right, you normally don't get that. That's not what you heard in elementary school about the Mongols. But um, Genghis Khan, the making of the um, Jack Rutherford or something, I think is his name. And um, that's a fabulous, eye-opening book about um, the making of the modern ideas, even the pre-Renaissance, uh, 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 through... Genghis Khan, and it's a wonderful book of history, just sort of uh, elevating your 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 view into the longer view of of what's going on today. It's not Those are... progress per se, but it's a it's a great. If you don't know that you like history, try that one. I will. I will. I will try those all of those books. I will get into them, and. You mentioned also, Kevin, that, and this is not me trying to be, you know, pessimistic at all. I'm just trying to, you know, hear the your perspective on these themes that were being thrown all the time. Uh, one of those is that, for example, Generation Z, my generation and millennials are having less children. You mentioned children, having kids, yeah. being with children. And it seems... It's concerning because personally for me, I would love to have a lot of children. <laughs> I love kids. But also, you know, when I think about when I read The Better Ages of Our Nature of Steven Pinker and listening to you saying that, you know, pretty much all of the indicators say that we're living in the best of times, which I subscribe to, I agree with. That one in particular, and also the unhappiness levels that perhaps we're mm -hmm. seeing and the solitude levels, especially in the United mm -hmm. States, are concerning indicators of perhaps, you know, we should measure also those kind of things yes. to measure progress. And so what's, yes. what's your perspective on this, if I make sense? Yeah. So um, you, you're right. We, we, when we think about progress, we don't want to just think about money. That's that's very boring, one-dimensional. We want to think about the whole spectrum of, of things that we find valuable, including things like contentment, ha happiness, satisfaction, um, 
And those are all crucial. Um, but I, I, I would say, you know, one of the, right now there's a whole field of happiness research and there's still a lot of um, controversy about exactly what it is and what they're measuring. And um, it's thwarted in part because we haven't been measuring it for very long. And trying to compare that to the past is really very difficult. But it is important. And so um, I, 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 I agree wholly that that, um, that should make up the bulk of our, of our metric not just how much money you have. I, th I think ha having a, a, a abundant money will become, you know, less and less important over time because it's just going to become the background. And I think, again, having purpose, having satisfaction, having contentment are going to become ever more important. Um, so is are we less content and happy now? We, the answer is we don't really know. We don't know. We've just been asking that question for the, you know, for a couple of decades, and we haven't really figured out. Think we can measure things like suicide, but you know, again, the suicide rates are actually down; they're not up. And so, um, again, we we have difficulty making some of these comparisons to a hundred or a thousand years ago because we just lack the data, um, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it is important to ask. And so um, I think we're not just talking about money. Um, I, I, I think what you want to optimize in your life and think about optimizing are these other qualities of, and, and, and one of the things we know from studies in the past 20 years is that there's a high correlation between having control of your time and your happiness. And probably a higher correlation than having a lot of money. Okay? And, 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 and you know, jokingly, one of the things, one of the bits of advice I tell young people like yourself is, is try as hard as you possibly can not to have a billion dollars. <laughs> because... There's kind of an inverted imprisoning effect of that billions. It, it basically takes over your life. You can never escape from it. It has a huge amount of obligations, and um, you have less control of your time. And so, um, uh, you you really should aim to be time wealthy rather than cash wealthy. That's, that's, that's my advice. And so the technology can, can enable that. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's the best case scenario is, is that we continue to try to give people more control over your time. It, it reminded me of, of, what you said in the excellent advice for leaving your book is that, you know, this is the best time to ever make something that we're not yeah. late, that all of the inventions we're going to be doing in the 20, and th th nothing has ever been invented like it's being now. And here's my mindset on, on wealth being time. And, you know, you, like you say, a billion dollars actually owning you rather than you owning them. The mindset that I'm growing on. And I think, my generation as well, I, I, don't, I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but we've been told that we should work for 40 years, mm -hmm. 50 years to get enough money. Mm. So when we you know, retire, we can actually yeah. own our time. And so in your perspective now with AI and all of, mm -hmm. all of those advancements, Kevin, how can we, how can I, you know, allow myself to be wealthy in time, even though I may not have all of the monetary resources. How, how do we get people to refocus away from money onto time? Um, the way I found it was actually talking to people who had accomplished things and who had more money than time and hearing their own regrets about, mm -hmm. about that. So um, I would talk to a lot of older people and about their about their lives and what they found doing and what they had regrets about. And I think 
you'll very quickly get the message that time is what you really want, is, is your precious treasure. Thank you, Alex, for um, some great questions. Kevin, I appreciate you joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening or watching this episode featuring Kevin Kelly. Like you saw, there were so many insights that Kevin shared with us. Unfortunately, I ran out of time with him. But anyways, this conversation, I hope it brought you some insights into, you know, both the inner and the outer spheres of life, not only how to understand the world around us, for example, reading history books, understanding how to harness that long uh, perspective from the Long Now Foundation, which Kevin is part of, but also the inner side of, of it all. How can we thrive understanding ourselves? For example, me as, as a member of Gen Z, like I mentioned during our conversation, there are so many themes that are being uh, thrown at us in terms of where to focus our life on, our career, our time on. And I hope that this conversation really allows you to bring that space of insights and truth to your own life. And if you enjoy this conversation, share it with a friend, share it with a loved one, or let me know in the comments or in Spotify or Apple. If you rated the show, it would also allow me to keep hosting great guests and also keep expanding the community that we are part of. So thank you for joining me again, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.